Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, May the 11th, 2021. It is currently 10.07 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church located right here in Ovalo, Texas. We're out, we're outside currently. It is rainy, foggy. It's kind of cold. I mean, it was like 91 degrees the other day, and now it's like 63 degrees and cold rain. I love the cold, foggy rain. I don't like the, I, I like the rain and the fog. I don't necessarily like the cooler temperatures, but yes, that that's what's going on here in West Texas. I know you were wanting to, to, to know that. I know as soon as you hit play, you're like, I wonder what the weather is there. I, I wonder what it's like outside. I know you really don't care, but I thought I would tell you anyway, right? Just to, to paint that mental picture, right? So I'm here inside the Sanctuary Victory Baptist Church. Outside, there's rain falling. It's cloudy. It's foggy. And I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute. You're not supposed to be at the church. You're supposed to be at a doctor's appointment. Yes, you are right. I'm supposed to be at the uh, VA clinic, the veterans clinic here, uh, there in Abilene, Texas. But I received a phone call letting me know that my doctor was, drum roll please, sick. <laughs> so my doctor is sick. So they told me, I'm sorry, we have to cancel your appointment. So I said, well, thank you so very much. And immediately I packed everything up and drove right here to the church so I could turn on this microphone and we could have, I don't know, a good discussion about something that is very much in the present. But we're going to take what's very much present in the present, right? Something that is present right now. And we're going to look at that subject And the way we're going to get there is by going way back to 330 A.D. In fact, we're going to go to May the 11th, 330 A.D., and we're going to use that to bring us to the present. I I think it will all make sense. Hopefully, it will be beneficial, and hopefully, you will be grateful for listening. So are you ready? Before we do anything else, we need to lay a a scriptural foundation down. That's what we need to do. I, I, I grabbed a notebook wrote down just a few scriptural references. By no means is this all of them. We could spend a lot of time. Clearly, I can't, you know, work through each one of these verses and exegete it and do a, a you know, a, a a complete teaching on each one of these verses right now, but I'll at least want to lay kind of a scriptural foundation for this discussion, all right? Are you ready? Let's start in John chapter 18. John chapter 18, because I think this is a very important passage of scripture. John chapter 18. Um, I'm in Matthew, so that's why it's not making any sense. <laughs> okay, John chapter 18. I was getting ready to go, oh no, I wrote down the wrong passage. John chapter 18. Here we go. John chapter 18. Context, Jesus has been brought before Pilate, right? And this is what happens. John chapter 18, verse 35. John chapter 18, verse 35. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus is being accused of a lot of things. The idea is that, hey, you claim to be a king. So basically, you know, are are you trying to set up an earthly kingdom, take over, you know, try to remove governmental power? You know, are you are you trying to, you know, are you trying to create an insurrection, treason? What are you trying to do? And Jesus, it makes sure Pilate clearly understands that my kingdom is not of this world. If that was the case, my followers would fight. But I told him not to fight because my kingdom is not of this world. He came to first and foremost establish a spiritual kingdom that we become part of through salvation. When we are saved, we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's the kingdom. Now, that does not deny that there will not be an earthly kingdom in the future. But when that earthly kingdom is established, Christ himself will come back to establish an earthly kingdom. But at that point right there, he was not establishing an earthly kingdom. And guess what? As of right now, he's still not establishing an earthly 
kingdom, all right? He has set up a spiritual kingdom that we become a part of through salvation. It's very important. Not an earthly kingdom, not as of right now. I know some eschatology doesn't believe there'll ever be an earthly kingdom. Other eschatology believes there will be, but this is not denying it, that, that I want to make sure this verse is not denying that there will cannot be a future earthly kingdom. But at that time, he was not setting one up. And currently, we're not to be running around trying to set up some earthly kingdom. That's not what we are trying to do. All right. That's very, very, very important principle. And I think a lot of Christians forget that. All right. Go to Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three. Let's get one other. Well, I've got a few scriptures here. Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Now, this is going to read differently in the King James than maybe other translations, but I'll explain. Philippians 3, 20. For our conversation, all right, or for our manner of life, or even if you look up the Greek word there, our citizenship, our citizenship, your citizenship, my citizenship is in heaven, that is where our citizenship is. Well, are we? I know from an earthly perspective, you can say, "Well, I'm a citizen of this country." I'm a cit- that may be fine, but from a spiritual perspective, as a Christian, the one citizenship that matters to you is your citizenship is not here on this earth. Your citizenship is in heaven, and because our citizenship is in heaven, guess what? That makes us here on this earth strangers, pilgrims. This is not our home. We are not of this world. We are simply passing through. This is not, we don't fight in a sense. Our, our, our citizenship, it's not about being a citizen of America or a citizen of Australia or a citizen of Canada. It's about being citizens in heaven. That's our citizenship. We are part of a spiritual kingdom. Our citizenship is in heaven. This, this earth is not our home. We are not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world, because everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it's all passing away. This world is going to burn up. This world is going to be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. So we are not, we are not trying to establish many kingdoms here. And our citizenship that we are worried about is not an earthly citizenship, but our heavenly citizenship. And we are to live uh, in accordance with being a citizen of heaven. Not, we do not live in accordance with being a citizen of the United States of America. And that doesn't mean we should be bad citizens here because we are told to be submissive to the earthly government because guess what? The earthly government is here for now, but we, we know ultimately we are focusing on something far greater and bigger, all right? Now we can move on to, how about First Peter chapter two? First Peter chapter two. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, we read this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. This is 1 Peter 2, 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. We're strangers and pilgrims. We should war against fleshly lust. Earthly lust, fleshly lust. We 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 don't we don't we should fight against that because we are strangers. We're pilgrims here. All right, very important concept. And then Matthew chapter sixteen. Matthew chapter sixteen. You may not see how this directly relates, but I think it's very important. Matthew chapter sixteen. Matthew chapter sixteen, verse twenty four. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, if we're going to be a follower of Christ, what must you do? You must deny yourself. It's not about you. All right. You die to self. You take up a cross. That's an instrument of death. So you deny yourself, you die to self, and you do not follow yourself. You follow Christ. So if you're going to, if you're going to be his disciple, you must come. If any man's going to come after him, you must deny yourself. Take up the cross, that's die to self, and you must follow Christ. Now, why is that all important? Because that that means your identity, you dying to self. It's not about your identity. It's not about your tribe. It's not about your country. It's not about any of that. We don't find our identity in 
in a country. We don't find uh, identity in fighting for a country or fighting for anything in a country because we are dying to self. It, we're following Christ. We are strangers and pilgrims here. This is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. His, the, ki- the kingdom he established is not of this world. We are, to se- we are to seek first the kingdom of God. We are to set our affections on things above. I don't know how many different ways you c- I can say it. This is not our home And yet Christians all over, especially the United States of America, have found themselves putting all of their focus right here on this earth, on this country, on the flag, on the Constitution, on the Bill of Rights. And they want to establish almost a mini kingdom of God here in the United States of America. They, they, it's all about fighting for the rights of a, a, as a, an American citizen and fighting for this and fighting for that. And, and now you're identified by your political party. You're identified by the, the country you were born in. You're identified by a flag. And all of that is so contrary to the biblical message. The biblical message is completely opposite to all of that. We, our commission is to go and teach, baptize, and teach. Evangelism, bring them into the church discipleship. We're to glorify God. We, we, we understand that, uh, that that's, that's the focus. To glorify God, serve him, call people to repentance and faith so that they become, can enter into the kingdom of God. And that's what we are focused on. But yet so much has come in and corrupted that way of thinking. This kind of a Christian nationalism has crept into the church. This political hijacking has crept into the church, and we are constantly have to fight against it. That is the biblical foundation. That's the scriptural foundation. And you you should build on that foundation. I'm just giving you some scriptures. Go find more scriptures. There's more and more. We are not of this world. Love not the world. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. I I could just add to it and add to it and add to it. It's a completely different mindset scripturally than you're finding in many churches here in the United States of America. Now, I say all of that to now lead us back to the past. May the 11th, 330 A.D., Something happened. Now, when you hear about what occurred, you may not immediately go, oh, wait a minute. That's, that's connected to the Christian nationalism of the present. You may, not see, you may not see that, but I want you to think about it because I think there's a correlation here and I think there is a lesson. Let's go back and let's find out what happened on this day in 330 AD. It had been, I think, I think it had been built... I think they've been building it for six years, if my if my r- memory is correct, for six years, and then it was consecrated uh, consecrated on this day, May the eleventh, three thirty A.D. What am I talking about? What am I referring to? Well, let's go to the Christian Almanac, a podcast that you should subs- subscribe to, and if you keep up with the theologycentral.net blog, go to theologycentral.net, go to the blog section. You would have saw, you would have seen that I posted this audio that you're about to hear right there on the theologycentral.net uh, pod page so that you could have already listened to it. But now we're going to listen to it and talk about it together. Are you ready? Thinking caps on. Here we go. It is the 11th of May, 2021. Welcome to the Christian History Almanac, brought to you by 1517 at 1517.org. I'm Dan Van Voris. Whenever a religion ties itself to a specific plot of land and then claims that the religion dictates that they keep that plot of land, we've got trouble. Stop right there. I want you to hear that. Whenever Christianity basically says, hey, this, this plot of land, they claim it, and then they're going to try to keep it, well, we've got trouble. Yeah, you've got trouble because now Christianity is becoming about something on this earth. It's about a place. It's about a, it's about a region. It's about a national identity. It becomes about all kinds of problems begin to emerge, and then usually, well, usually what happens, biblical Christianity gets corrupted 
uh, completely. So I'm gonna I'm gonna back that up and play that all again because I want you to hear that. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to their intro and everything. That's perfectly okay. Hearing this a couple of times will not hurt. Trust me. Let's go. Here we go. It is the 11th of May, 2021. Welcome to the Christian History Almanac, brought to you by 1517 at 1517.org. I'm Dan Vanvoris. Whenever a religion ties itself to a specific plot of land and then claims that the religion dictates that they keep that plot of land, we've got trouble. And one of the truly attractive elements of the Christian faith is that it is decentralized from one land or one people. The Did you hear that? Christianity is decentralized from one place or one people. In other words, Christianity has nothing to do with a specific people or a specific place or a specific country. Christianity has nothing to do with that. Christianity is not about a national identity, about a, a, a certain geographical region. It's not about being an American. It's not about being Australian. It's not about being Canadian. It's not be, being Japanese. It's not being whatever. I mean, we have people listen to us from all over the world. India, I mean, India right now, I don't know why we have so many people listening to us in India. Uh, yesterday, I think yesterday, India was the, pl- the number one place people were listening to us in, which is the first time that's ever happened. It's always the United States of America. So I don't know what was going on there. But, but wherever you are, Christianity is not about that land not about that national identity. Christianity is not even about our own personal identity. Christianity is where a group of individuals die to self, die to their will, their desires, their identity, and we now find our identity in Jesus Christ. It's not about being an American. It's not about being anything else. It's about being a Christian. It, it goes over all of that. It, it, it's decentralized from all of that. That is such, I don't know why America, especially in America, I don't know why American Christians have completely lost this basic idea. I'm going to play all of that again. I'm going to play all of that again. I know it may get irritating, but I just want you to really let these lessons sink in, all right? And you're like, where? how are we going to get back to May the 11th, 330 AD? We're going to get there, all right? Because clearly, Something happened in May the uh, something happened on May the eleventh, three thirty A.D. that placed Christianity uh, made Christianity connected to a land and a place. All right, which is why it's very significant to understand it. Right, so I'm going to back all of this up one more time. I know it's okay. Now listen to it carefully. Here we go. It is the eleventh of May, two thousand. 21. Welcome to the Christian History Almanac, brought to you by 1517 at 1517.org. I'm Dan Van Voris. Whenever a religion ties itself to a specific plot of land and then claims that the religion dictates that they keep that plot of land, we've got trouble. And one of the truly attractive elements of the Christian faith is that it is decentralized from one land or one people. The other Abrahamic faiths, Judaism and Islam, have not had such a luxury, and this has led to perennial strife in the Middle East. Unfortunately, Christians have had a hard time with the idolatry of place, and this has given the history of the church both metropolitan and militant aspects. I want you to hear that. Christianity has struggled with the idolatry of place. The idolatry of place. How about we call it the idolatry of country? How about the idolatry of the Constitution? How about the idolatry of political party? Oh, I'm not supposed to say that. I'm not, I'm not supposed to say, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Harry. All right, just disregard, disregard. Let's continue. If we're looking at the early church, we obviously can look at Rome after the conversion of Constantine. But too often with Rome, when we see the empire falling to the Goths, etc., in 476, we move our attention to the peasants and plagues of the medieval world. Except, of course, the Roman Empire didn't fall in 476. 
By 476, the empire had already moved its de facto capital from Rome to Constantinople, and it would remain there until the fall of Constantinople in 1453. And it was on this day, the 11th of May in 330, that Constantine had his new Byzantine city consecrated as Constantinople and the new capital of the Roman Empire. In honor of this anniversary today, we are going to go through a list of the five things you should know about Constantinople. First, its location. It is on the Bosphorus Strait. That's the strait which links the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. It was the easternmost of the western cities and has always served as a bridge between the east and the west, between European and Asian, between Occidental and Oriental. There are few pieces of land more geographically significant than this place. Number two, some claim that Constantine wanted a refresh for the empire to get away from the pagan Roman roots, except that when he built Constantinople, it looked just like Rome. Same kind of buildings, same kind of statues, even one of Constantine himself as the god Apollo. Number three, it was the home for a number of the early ecumenical councils. That council at Constantinople in 381, that's responsible for the Nicene Creed as many Christians recite it today. Number four, with the split between the Orthodox and Roman Catholic Church in 1054, Constantinople would come to represent the seat of Eastern Christianity, while the Latin West would set up shop in Rome. There was a time from 1204 to 1261 when the Latin West came into Constantinople, but after 1261, it remained with the Eastern Church. And finally, while it was officially called Constantinople, it became common when traveling to the city to say, I am going into the city, which in Greek sounds like Istanbulin. Istanbul could become Istanbul and then Istanbul. This is the name of the city today, which was a major center for the Ottoman Empire after 1453, and of course, Istanbul still a very significant city in the world. As we started with the show, Christianity is not tied to any specific plot of land any more than it is a faith for a certain kind of people. But the history of Rome and then Constantinople have revealed flaws in the human grasp for power and potential for violence. But even still, we can recognize the rich history of this city situated between two worlds, on the Bosphorus in modern-day Turkey. Today, we remember the consecration of this great city as Constantinople on this, the 11th of May, in 330. The last word for today comes from the epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 3, a good word that takes our eyes away from nationalisms and towards Jesus. It reads... So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints, and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This has been the Christian History Almanac for the 11th of May, 2021, brought to you by 1517 at 1517.com. Or there you have it. Today is the consec- we remember the consecration of Constantinople on May the 11th, 330 AD, where then Christianity became attached to a land, a place, and that has happened throughout church history. And whenever it happens, usually violence emerges 
fighting and all kinds of other things takes place. We can't go through everything in regards to church history, but we have to get our eyes off a place, off a people, off a, off a nationalism. We are about, we all come together. We're no, we're not, we're strangers and pilgrims on this earth, but we're not strangers and pilgrims in the household of God. And guess what? The household of God doesn't have an American flag flying over it, an Australian flag or any other flag over it. It has Jesus Christ ruling and reigning over it. That is who we look to. That is our identity. Our identity is not any other flag. That's why in my church, I know people think it's crazy. There is no American flag anywhere on this property. There never will be. There will not be one outside. There will not ever be one inside this building under any circumstances because that is not our banner. That is not our identity. Our identity is the cross that is hanging on the wall right in front of me and the cross that is in front of, that is uh, uh, right there on, on, in front of my pulpit. That's our identity. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is, that is our identity. Now, I know some people think that that's an extreme, but it's not an extreme. It's, it's a very important symbol. When you walk in here, you don't see a flag because we're not representing America. We're not identified as an American. That The church is for anyone of any nationality, any background, and we're not promoting one country over another country. We're promoting the, the, the uh, kingdom of God over everything. That is the way we have to focus. So it's just, that, that's where we need to focus. And it's just interesting that on this day, Christianity beca- became attached, at least in part, to a particular location in a particular place. But Christianity should transcend that. And I'll, and I just want I just wanted to at least get you thinking in this w- way because I've tried to combat the whole Christian nationalistic m- idea. I've been fighting against it even before we started talking about nationalism. I, I I've always referred to it as the political hijacking of American Christianity, or it's the nationalistic hijacking of American Christianity. But I did receive an interesting email from someone, and I wanted to share this with you. All right, it says, "Hi, Pastor." Really appreciating your uh, you, your exploring of the matter of discernment over the last few podcasts. On the matter of globalism versus nationalism that was brought up in this particular episode, there is something that always annoys me when it comes to evangelicals. All right, well, there, there's, there's a lot of things that annoy me when it comes to evangelicals. So let me hear what annoys you. All right, let's see if we're on the same page. If nationalism is the supposed solution for evangelicals to promote, whose nationalism? Am I, as an Australian citizen, supposed to promote American nationalism or Australian nationalism? A coalition of Western nationalists whose countries have their own ideals and values, but then does that not come become just a conservative version of the so-called one world government? So it's bad if the evil leftist Marxists establish globalism, but when we have a collective of conservative nationalistic nations establishing establishing conservative globalism, it's all of a sudden fine. Now, I added it's all of a sudden. He just said is fine, but that's what he's asking. Is it all of a sudden fine? If So if all the conservative nations get together promoting some kind of a nationalistic idea of conservative values and we all come together, that's not the new world order. But if it's leftist Marxists, then it's a new world order and it's satanic and it's going to destroy our country and we've got to fight against it through nationalism. And these are the battles Christians want to talk about even in Christian podcasts. He goes on to say, I'll say that for the most part, evangelicals in Australia have avoided the whole nationalistic bent that our American counterparts have adopted. Well, I need to move to Australia. Okay, that's that's what I need to do. Because let me tell you, the American nationalistic garbage drives me insane. And I'm an American. And and as soon as I fight against it, what, what I don't, this, this person emailing may know this or may not know this, but what makes me so mad is I immediately get emails saying, oh, you hate America. You're not patriotic. You're garbage. You don't do anything for this country. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm a disabled vet who spent uh, 22 years, 19 years active duty. And then the rest of the years as a, a civilian contractor, I don't know, serving this country, but you're right. I'm not patriotic and I'm, no, I'm a Christian. 
I'm a Christian before I'm an American. I just happen to be born in America, but my citizenship is in heaven. Okay, that I don't I don't know why Christians have such a hard time with this. Well, let's let's read this again. All right. I'll say that for the most part, evangelicals in Australia have avoided the whole nationalistic bent and that our American counterparts have adopted. But there is a section of the church here that envies American-style patriotism right down to the obsessive gun culture that permeates conservative circles. Well, let me tell you, I'm sorry. Please tell those people that envy anything in America, don't, don't, just don't do it. Please don't envy our uh, obsessive gun culture. Please don't do that. I mean, we just, we had nine mass shootings over the weekend in the United States of America. Not one, not two, but nine, okay? But guess what the, cons- the solution is to conservative Christians? More guns! <laughs> that, that's, that's the solution. So yeah, don't, please don't, don't do that. Now, I'm, now I just ticked off who knows how many Christians are going to be mad at me, but that's okay. All right, because they're going to, what about the Constitution? I'm a Christian, okay? I don't, I don't know what people don't get. All right, all right, here we go. Um, so they, they, they envy American-style patriotism right down to the obsessive gun culture that permeates conservative circles. I also find it interesting that nations, specifically in Asia and Africa, where the church is the relative minority religion, that nationalism is rarely ever the solution that is pursued. Ah, that's... Very good point. If you're in a country where your religion is the minority, you usually, you're not out there promoting and pushing for nationalism. You're not. You're looking for something else because you realize, wait, we're in the minority. In many cases, you're being persecuted. In many, in many cases, you're just you're basically irrelevant. You have no political power. You have no political say so. So guess what the church does? All of a sudden, it starts looking towards my, you know, uh, this world is not my home. My hope is in Jesus Christ. He's my strength and my refuge. My identity is in Christ. My identity is not in this country. My hope is not found in this country. My hope, yeah, I, it's amazing how spiritual you become. When you have no nothing to the flesh to rely on, see when every when when everything when when you lose everything pertaining to the flesh, you become super spiritual. But as soon as you still got something to lean on on the up with the flesh, oh, you're going to look for it. you're going to look for political power. You're going to look for political solutions. You're going to try to force pol- uh, Christian morality through political laws and bills that are being passed. And you're going to do everything. You're going to rely on the arm of the flesh until the arm of the flesh is taken away. That's why I hope. I, I what I I I, tr- I I truly hope this. I hope that. Republicans lose every bit of, I, w- I want to wake up one day and there's not a Republican in office. They're not, they're not the president, vice president, Senate, co- uh, Congress, uh, governor, mayor. I mean, there's just no Republican. They're all just gone. And in Christian, and in Christians have no political ally to look to. They're like, there's no Republicans. So who do we look to? No, ev- the entire political structure is in against Christianity. I know that would be bad for Christianity, and I know it can mean losing a lot of rights, but guess what? It would possibly make Christians have to realize, stop looking to the arm of the flesh and look actually to Jesus Christ, look to the scriptures, and actually try to be spiritual in your thinking. I know that that's crazy when I say that, and people lose lose their mind when I say that, but I'm so tired of the church looking for political power, political solution, and trying to impose Christian morality through the the political arm. If you want people to adopt Christian morality, then bring them to the Savior. Bring them to the Savior, all right? And then when they, when they become a Christian, then you teach them to obey. Remember the way the Great Commission works? You teach evangelism, you baptize, you bring them into the church, then then you teach them to obey all the things that he had commanded. Teaching lost people or forcing peace, uh, lost people to try to obey what the scriptures say, well, you don't accomplish anything other than creating maybe an external form of morality that still leads everyone to hell. Are you more, are you more worried about the morality and the world around you or are you more worried about the eternal souls of the people around you? There's a very big difference. Uh, but I think that's it's very interesting. Where uh, in those countries where uh, Christianity is the minority religion, nationalism is rarely ever seen uh, as the solution. It's rarely ever the solution that is pursued. 
Is there something that we in the West can glean from our brothers and sisters in the East we don't, who don't share our nationalistic culture? I think, yeah, I think what we learn from them is what you've just pointed out. When you don't have the arm of the flesh to rely on, you're going you're gonna to look to spiritual, you're going to be spiritual in your mindset. But as long as, as long as you have that arm of the flesh, you're going you're gonna to look to it and you're going to try to gain power and, and, and use it. He said, just a few gripes I hope that uh, I have that I hope would be interesting enough to generate a discussion. Well, it definitely generated a discussion. Um, I'm going to give everyone your email address because when they get mad at me, I'll just forward them to you. No, I won't. I won't do that to you. Uh, but no, I thank you. That, and that's from a listener in Australia. That's, and again, I, that's what I always find so interesting. This American, this, this American form of Christianity who, who is the American form of Christianity for? Is the American form of Christianity for someone living in China? Is the American form of Christianity for someone living in Mexico? No, we, 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 we just argue and argue and argue for a Christ, an American Christian nationalism that actually would be offensive and probably keep people from other countries even wanting to be a part of Christianity. You never want Christianity attached to a country. Christianity should never have a nationalistic identity. It's not an American Christianity. It's not an Australian Christianity. It's just Christianity. It's not associated with a place or a country. And the, and, and it, the, the longer we connect it to that, it's a, no. When someone walks into this church, they should hear Christianity. They should not hear America. They should not hear the Constitution. No, no. That's how come in this church we don't do um, you know, Fourth of July, uh, Memorial Day. We don't do any patriotic celebrations in this church, and t- definitely we would never see any patriotic songs because that's not what this is about. It's not about America, America, America. It's about the eternal kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom of God. It's about Christ. And yes, if he comes to establish a kingdom, then by all means, he will come. He will establish an earthly kingdom and that kingdom will be identified by him. Again, even even that will be different than our nationalistic approaches to things. So I just think it's interesting that on this date in 330 AD, Christianity becomes kind of attached to a place and a people. And that problem, that problem kind of continues. And even, even after the quote unquote, the, People kind of turn away from Rome. They then they go back and look to Constantinople, and 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 it's it's just interesting that that happens. And we could go into a big discussion of church history. But I wanted to bring all of that to your attention this morning. And uh, well, you can it, just as that listener did. If you want to be a part of the conversation, you can always email me at newsif at yahoo dot com. Newsif at yahoo dot com. And thank you for listening. Where we went back to the past to understand the present, and that's kind of re- the why we study church history. People often ask, why do you focus on church history so much? Because you can't, you, you, you can never truly understand the present without understanding the past. And I think, hopefully, I was able to accomplish a little of that in this episode. All right, thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.